I'm glad to be here. I got to tell you guys, the uh, very first time I met Pete, felt like I fell in love with the man. And I love what we're doing here at Forge. I really believe that men that are unleashed change the world, or at least we change our world with our wife and our kids and our family. So I've already prayed for you men, but can I just pray for you again? Could you bow your heads a second time? Holy God, we thank you that you're speaking, God, and you want to speak to us here today. I believe in this message. I believe you've given this message to me. I believe you've spent decades putting this into my heart. And so, Lord, I pray that out of my broken life and broken words, you would communicate life to all of us here today. We ask you for that in the great name of Jesus. Amen. Before we launch into this, I just want to briefly tell you about myself, who I am. I'm a Florida boy. I was born in Melbourne, brought up in Merritt Island, and we lived there until the fifth grade, and then we journeyed up to the Midwest. And um, I was not brought up in a Christian home. I was a pagan until 17. And uh, this will really date myself, but have any of you seen the Bob Newhart show from way back when? My dad was Bob Newhart. Uh, the Andy Griffith Show, my mom was Aunt B. And um, like I said, I wasn't brought up in a Christian home, and I was also brought up in a home where there wasn't a lot of love. And what I mean by that is almost all of us here, or many people I find, are brought up without a dad being engaged. Someone that is aloof and unemotional and, una- and non-affectionate. That was my dad. That was also my mom. So I got a double dose of that, and what that did was that horribly afflicted me with a deep self-reliance, a deep need to validate myself through accomplishment and achievement. And so that was my story until age 17. I love what John Eldridge said, and this is not an exact quote, but the deepest beliefs, deepest held beliefs that we often have about ourselves are not things that we've thought through, they're things that were poured into our soul like wet concrete in our upbringing. And so what the message to me that was given in my upbringing was that I wasn't all that significant. And so like that concrete, it hardened into a self-will, a self-reliance in my approach to life. The result of that, in some ways, was very good. I succeeded in everything. And so, at age 17, I was in the in crowd in high school. I was part, I was in the top 10 academically. I was playing my two varsity sports. I was dating a cheerleader. I was driving a 69 Chevy with a booming eight track player. (laughs) You guys remember the eight track. And as a pagan, I'm driving around listening to Cheap Trick live at Budokan. I want you to want me, I need you to need me, the beauty of the 8-track. So at age 17, in came Jesus into my life at Frontier Ranch, and when I heard the gospel message, I knew for the rest of my life, I was going to be serving my new king and living all out for him. It's taken me a long time, it's taken me a lifetime actually to realize that Jesus did not die on the cross merely to forgive the guilt of my sin, but to deal with the shame of my heart. So a year later, I went to Ohio State University. Uh, Let me correct that. The Ohio State (laughs) University. Oh, the arrogance of us Buckeyes. All I can do is confess that. I got to be part of a church plant as a junior in college. I mean, who gets that opportunity? It was crazy. We'd gone on a spring break trip to Bowling Green, Ohio, and I remember saying to a friend, this is like the last place on earth that I would ever want to live. A short time after that, some friends said, hey, we're going on a church, church plant to Bowling Green. I said, that's great, I just got accepted into the physical therapy program here at Ohio State. And they said, you don't understand, we want you to come with us. 
So I dropped out of college. My parents weren't too happy about that. Moved to Bowling Green, was involved in a church plant that has since planted 10 other churches. It was ridiculous. It was crazy. It was really beautiful. I moved from there when I graduated, um, became a pastor, and started my own church at Ball State University. I was there for about 13, 14 years before I realized I hate cold weather and moved back here to Florida in 2001. I pastor a church, H2O, that is all about reaching unchurched people. We kind of drive churchy people out of being with us. I may do that to you today as well. I don't know. Um, I, along the way, gained one wife and four kids. I really wanted a boy, but I had a girl, and then a girl, and then a girl. They called me the X-Man for a while. <laughs> they weren't sure if there was a Y chromosome. And I, uh, I was in the office to get clipped. I hope that's not too much information. <laughs> My wife was working that day, and so I took a buddy of mine. Didn't think through that real well. I'm in the office with my friend, and I realized, wow, we really look awkward here. And my spirit was stirred. It's like, no, I want a boy. So I left. I went back home, and I prayed this little prayer. It's like, God, I know my wife wants me back in that office, and I want a boy. We got like two weeks here. Can you provide about two weeks later, my wife said, hey, we're pregnant. I didn't know at the time that God's plan for dealing with my shame had to do with my son. But that's a big part of my story that I want to share with you. So that's a little bit about me. We're in part two, I think, of this series uh, called Shame, Sex, and Freedom. My talk, if I were to title this, would be My Surprising Path to Freedom. This is a really hard talk for me to give, to be honest with you, because... I'm going to talk about emotion and shame and vulnerability, and this stuff isn't talked about in many Christian circles. And so for me, when I first heard this, it was like someone is speaking a foreign language. Like, I see your lips are moving, I hear it, but like, I don't understand what you're saying. And so uh, my concern is that this talk would go over your head. I sure hope it doesn't. I trust that God will speak to you despite. Our calling as men is primarily to live as sons. It's primarily about being. It's not about doing. Our doing needs to flow out of our being. So we're called to live as sons, but also as providers, leaders, and warriors. And you can't live that way without a heart that is fully alive and fully engaged with God and your world. The obstacles to our progress in living out this great calling of ours, we've been told, is the world, the flesh, and the devil. Wholeheartedly agree. I just think that list is incomplete. I think one of the obstacles to us living out of our heart is often, sadly, the church. The world disciples us. It teaches us that wild, unleashed, untamed masculinity is not really wanted. But the church also disciples us into a lesser image of masculinity. Let me unpack that for you. If we had Jesus as our pastor, what we would see modeled for us is raw, unbridled masculinity. Remember when he pulled out the whip. <laughs> We'd learn that men are supposed to exhibit emotion. Not just anger, but profound tenderness. We'd see that Christianity is not just about learning doctrine, but it requires our whole heart. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Do you know what it's called when we focus on doctrine and we miss our heart and minimize our sin? It's called Phariseeism. It's what God hates. We'd see vulnerability like Jesus modeled in the garden when he said, my soul is grieved to the point of death. And we'd look at that and we'd say, that's manly. We'd be equipped to live out our calling knowing that life demands my full heart. 
If we had Paul as our pastor, spiritual leader, we'd see the same all-out commitment to not hide his struggle, even his struggle with sin. Remember Romans seven fifteen. I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. He's saying, I struggle with sin. And he's saying that to a church that he's never met. And what he means is wide open to interpretation. Like, I want to say, dude, what, like, what was your struggle? And he's secure enough not to answer that question. We'd get that struggle and depression and hardship are just part of the Christian journey. They're not antithetical to the spirit-filled life, but part of it. 2 Corinthians 1, he said, We do not want you to be unaware, brothers, of the affliction we experienced in Asia. We were so utterly burned beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. He felt the freedom to communicate. I want you to know I'm really hurting. I've been despairing. We would never again say fine when someone asks us, how are you doing? Because we've had modeled through Jesus and Paul an authenticity and vulnerability that is defined as masculinity. But chances are we've not had those guys as our pastors and spiritual leaders. And speaking as a pastor, it is most pastors I know are very good-hearted, godly men, but we've been brought up focusing more on doing than on being. And it's so easy to fall into the temptation to accept the pedestal and to speak more about our strengths than we do about our struggles. And I think it's telling. I think it's telling that there have been so many scandals involving pastors in this city, don't you? I think that has something to do with this topic. I think it's telling that when someone is brought up in a Christian home, they almost always carry significant baggage with them. That's why kids flee Christianity when they reach college. Without this understanding that we need to focus not only on doing, but on being, our, the trajectory will, will trend toward performance and not identity, and minimizing our struggle rather than revealing it. So maybe it's just me, but what I was taught in the church was to believe and to do. What I was not taught was how to be vulnerable and how to trust the community that is around you. I used to co-pastor with my best friend, and he was the most gifted uh, spiritual leader that I've ever known. But he had stuff in his heart that he needed to trust his community with, and he couldn't. He couldn't trust enough to share his struggle. And I remind all of us here that what God has given us is his word, and we love his word, and he's given us his spirit, and we love his spirit, but he's also given us his people. And I found that in my early days, I leaned toward the first two. And now, over much time, I've learned how to trust the third. The watershed moment of my life was when I was a burned-out pastor, and I went to a pastor's retreat, and um, it was like all teaching, which is the last thing a burned-out pastor <laughs> needs, for sure. It's like, are you guys idiots? What are you doing here? And um, I found myself in a talk on sexual addiction, I have many friends that struggle with that. Most people I know in some ways struggle with that. That wasn't my particular struggle. But as I listened to the speaker address this topic, I raised my hand and I, I said, how do we create a culture in our church where people can be vulnerable about their struggle with this? Because otherwise, aren't we wasting our time? And the expert, as he spoke on this topic, said, well, that's the million-dollar question. That is the million-dollar question. And he moved on. I'm not a real judgy type. You know, I'm pretty compassionate. But in that moment, looking around at the 100 pastors that were in the room who were undisturbed by a Christianity that refused to be open and honest, I was 
angry. And I raised my hand a second time and said, can I answer my own question? And what I said was, it is required of us as pastors that we impart a Christianity that is real, that's authentic, and we all know that that involves struggle. We all know that we struggle against sin. We all struggle with our emotions. We all struggle with shame. And so it is required of us to be the biggest sinners in our church, as Paul said. That's a watershed moment for me because as a man, as a child of God, and as a pastor, I decided I will never hide my stuff again. I will never wipe a tear away from my face. I will never hide what is going on in me. Really, this talk is very, very simple. Because of the gospel of grace, we are accepted unconditionally. And that not only does something between us and the Father, but that is meant to do something between us and our brothers. It creates a community, a band of brothers that will say, you share your stuff and I will not flinch. And I will move toward you just as God moves toward me. And I've seen this happen so many times. When I'm vulnerable with my stuff, it normalizes people. It's like, what? They look at me and think, you're a royal mess. You're totally screwed up, but you love Jesus and it seems to be working for you. And I'm kind of drawn to that. I feel like there's hope for me. Vulnerability is powerful. It is authentic. It is life-giving. It is not weakness. So here's what God did to teach me this lesson. It was really a very simple talk. My journey has been totes cray-cray, as we say in my family. It's totally crazy. God has done some ridiculous things to teach me this one lesson. The first thing he did was he took me through ridiculously hard circumstances. Part of that involves my four kids. When we had three, I was driving along the street, and I saw a deer, and I said, Ah, if I had my gun, we could kill that. And I heard my kids respond. First was the second child, our nature lover. And she said, oh, daddy, don't kill it. It's nature. Then my oldest daughter responded like, Kara, it's only wrong if you don't use the meat for food and the hide for clothing. It's quiet for a minute. Then I heard the voice of the third. Yeah, let's kill it. <laughs> I love that story. So I decided I'll lead my church and I'll love my kids. Jana plunged into postpartum depression and then full-blown depression that lasted about a decade. And so I thought, I got this. I'll lead my church and I'll love my kids and I'll carry my wife. Then one of my kids became a rebel. Guess which one that was. <laughs> I'll kill it. I'll lead my church. I'll love my kids. I'll carry my wife, and I'll spend three hours a day on this one. Then I was asked to coach some other churches, and I said, I got this. I'll lead my church, and I'll love my kids, and I'll carry my wife, and I'll spend three hours a day on this one, and I'll continue to give of my heart to a growing world. And I slowly ground down to a halt. I just want to remind you guys that trials and hardships aren't just God developing our character, it's God pursuing our heart. God wants your heart. So he crushed me so that I'd stop de defending, depending on myself. That's how 2 Corinthians 1.8 continues. In verse 9 he says, so that I would no longer depend on myself. The second thing God did was God provided me masculine role models of what vulnerability looked like. I had dudes step into my life as I was going through a horrible difficulty, and they began to speak powerful words to me. I have this friend, Greg, who's been a life mentor, and God has used him in such crazy ways in my life. You know, he's a man's man. He was a, a wrestler in college. He's a burly dude. He disciples men like he wrestles, like he pins you. It's horrible. It's very uncomfortable. And so, like I said, he's a man's man. And as I was going through these extreme difficulties, 
we had this talk in a coffee bar with tears rolling down his eyes as he said, John, I love you, I'm committed to you, but I want to know the good and the bad and the ugly of your heart. But you don't share that with me. Here's where things get, as I said, totes cray-cray. God brought some guys into my church that were in recovery. And what I mean by that is that they had blown up their marriages or their ministries through adultery or sexual addiction. They brought them into our church. And they went on this retreat, and I was invited on to this retreat, something about living from your heart. And in my naivety, I thought, oh, yeah, sounds great. Let's go do that. And so we had this retreat of 20 guys, and like 15 of them were, we're nice Christian guys, and five of them were fighting for their lives. And we began with this exercise, which was led by a 75-year-old, five-foot-five woman. And she had this exercise where she gave everyone three tablets of aspirin, and then we were to go up to every man in the room and say, I have medicine for you, or I have no medicine for you. And I thought, oh, this is cute. And then the first guy went, who was one of the guys that was in recovery, huge biceps, and he steps up to his friend, and he begins to weep, and he says, I have no medicine for you. And it connected, this is real life here. I'm a medicine bearer. But my heart has to be fully alive to show up for my wife. My heart needs to be fully alive to show up for my kids and for myself and for my church. At the end of that exercise, she asked how many people had two aspirin, how many had three. I looked down at my hand and like there's a pile of aspirin. It's like crap. (laughs) And she asked all the other guys there, it's like, how do you guys feel about this guy, the one who's the least engaged here, having all the aspirin. And it's like, what are you doing? And so I said, hey, I just want to say you are publicly shaming me. This seems very inappropriate. And she came over and stood before me, five foot five, 75 year old woman. And she said, can I tell you what I see in you? And it's like, "Uh (laughs) uh-oh. Like I have a choice. And she said, I see a scared little boy. I was so angry. I asked her later, I said, why did you do that? Why did you come after me like you did? And her answer is telling. She said, I've known a lot of pastors and I've known a lot of Christians and almost every single one of them that I know doesn't live from their heart and you're not living from your heart because of the stuff you've had to deal with. You need to get free of that. You're not meant to live life in your own power. One of the guys that was on that retreat took me to an SA meeting. And he said, John, this is going to be really uncomfortable for you, but just trust me and come to it with me. So I went, and there was a group of about seven guys that were all struggling with sexual addiction. And we went for a walk afterward, and he said, you know, when you don't have a big problem, being in an SA group feels pretty uncomfortable, right? I said, yeah, it does. He said, you know, in the church, if you've got a big problem, you feel uncomfortable. The church should be more like an SA group. I thought, yeah, we're not honest. We're not vulnerable. We don't acknowledge our brokenness. I want you to imagine a pool. I'm going to call it the pool of vulnerability. It's got a shallow end where you can just step through a number of steps and slowly enter this pool. There's also a deep end where you can plunge into it. At that point in my life, I realized this is a new language to me. I have just got to learn vulnerability. I've got to get the shame that's in my heart out of me. I need to get fear that is in my heart out of me. This world needs me to live unleashed, and I want to do that. I jumped in the deep end. Everyone craves unconditional love, right? But you know what? You can only experience unconditional love in that which has been brought out, in that which has been revealed. That's why vulnerability is so important. 
I hope you guys are tracking with me here. A friend of mine made this image. It's of the prodigal son. The delight of the father is amazing. The confusion of the son is what we experience. I know God loves me, but... And that but is because of our struggles and our sin and our shame. And my point is, God will never physically walk beside you, at least not in this life, and say, that was so courageous for you to be open. God himself will not physically be there to say, I'm walking with you. God will never physically say, no matter what you're going through, I am with you. We have his words in the gospel. We know that is truth through the Holy Spirit, but that's the task of the church. That's the task of men to empower men as we struggle. I hope you guys are tracking with me. The gospel enables vulnerability. Vulnerability weakens the power of shame, and weakening the power of shame sets the man free. I asked my son if I could share this, and he said absolutely, because he is a real man. He got bullied in the seventh grade. He felt emasculated. He turned to porn. I don't know how I began to detect that that was an issue with him. It felt very awkward to ask him, dads, ask your sons. But he opened up about that, and, and we began to work on the power of shame and the power of vulnerability and the truth of the gospel and the delight of the Father, and I saw my son's heart blossom. And the trajectory of his life just changed. He just led his first person to Christ a couple weeks ago. Last week at a, at a men's meeting with a group of 10 guys, we talked about vulnerability and we asked the question, what is your struggle with shame? And my son went first and openly shared. And then every man at that table opened up about their struggle. Whether it was with pornography or masturbation, or people-pleasing, or feeling that they're not enough, whatever it was, vulnerability begets vulnerability. And these men, over time, have entered into the pool of vulnerability. They've entered in as men carrying secrets, but they come out of that pool on the other side as warriors. So I want to close with a short story about what freedom looks like, what it looks like to get our heart unleashed, to get whatever we have dealt with. And it has to do with my son. When he was seven, he was playing soccer. I was one of the coaches. And as a totally unbiased dad, I recognized that he had more talent than anyone else on the team. And, um, and he did. It was true. And so the first game came, and... He looked boyish. Well, it's true, he was seven, he was a boy, but I recognize a scared little boy because I've been one. I knew. He's, he's, he has fear. And so I began to coach him a little bit on some skills, but mostly on his heart. And we developed a secret signal, which means live from your heart. Don't allow fear. All out, leave it all out on that field. So the next game came along and he scored a goal. It's like, yeah. But the ball kind of rolled in front of his foot and kicked it. That's it. So, like, ah, improvement. The next game after that came and he scored several times. It's like, wow, really sense some freedom here. And then the next game came. Score was zero to zero at halftime. And I went over to him and looked down into his little seven-year-old eyes. And I said, son, you know what your team needs from you right now. And he nodded his head. And I said, Caleb, they need you to just go off. I walked back, sat down. The players walked onto the field. My son came up to midfield, looked over at his dad. 
and basically communicated, here it comes. Over the next 20 minutes, he scored with his left foot, with his right foot, on a throw-in, on a fast break. He scored six times in 20 minutes. Six times. Parents were walking up to me. It's like, what did you feed him? <laughs> and I didn't say this, but the answer was I didn't. God's setting his heart free. I'm real cautious about saying when I hear God's voice because I think that's so often abused. But as I walked off the field with my arm around my son, God spoke to me. And he said, this is what I'm doing in your life. I'm unleashing your heart. I hope this message makes sense to you. It's really very simple. The gospel frees us with our struggle. And a band of brothers can speak truth and life into our hearts. That's all I got. I hope that's helpful.